What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to Double Coverage. We hope you're still living, loving, and breathing sport. I'm Dom with the Great Man Sauce, and another special guest today, Jay Gion, aka Studio Underscore Collector. How are you going? What's up, guys? Thanks for having me, Studio Collector, over here. Anytime. Great man, how are you going, Sauce? Oh, I'm you excited? Good. I'm good, Dom, as you know. Um... And uh, yeah, excited to have Jay on the show. Have uh, chopped it up with him a, a bit in the DMs on IG. Um, had some good conversation. <laughs> yeah, we did. So um, I mean, I thought you know he's got some interesting p- perspectives. So uh, you know, I was like, why not uh, open the invitation, get him on the show, and um, you know, I think this will make for a, for a cool podcast um, because I, I like some of his uh, views on things. And and uh, yeah, let's see how this transpires. Definitely. Oh, let's get straight into it. So, Jay, uh, tell us about yourself, uh, your work background, and yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I can start uh, first where I'm, where I'm from. Um, you know, I was born in South Korea, actually. Uh, I was born and raised there until about 10 years old. And what I can tell you that's relevant to this hobby is I got introduced to this hobby of collecting basketball cards in South Korea, actually. Uh, it wasn't in the U.S., uh, so this was back in 1997, six, and yeah. I wasn't even yeah I wasn't even in the capital city. It was some rural country down way down south of South Korea, and for some reason there was a local hobby shop right <laughs> by my elementary school. I don't know what that guy was doing. I don't know if he was making any money. I have no clue, <laughs> but he was there, and um, I used to go there just open up like cheap packs i don't even recall what they were just upper deck um i couldn't afford the spx hollow view ones because those are like the more more premier uh packs Um, but that's how i my collecting started uh came over to the us uh because my grandparents were here and they invited us in from south korea so um once i came in that's when i started discovering cards in Kmart and you know I used to buy like upper deck boxes for 20 bucks um, it was super it was dirt cheap and and I and I used to I didn't know how to take care of cards and they were just all like damaged and um, those are all like crap now um, but I that I collected for about two to three years and I stopped you know and then usual things like you go to high school you get busy with college um, and I completely forgot about it um, and came back from college, um, came back to California from the East Coast, and I was just bored one day, and I think it was 20, 2018. And I was just bored at home, and I was telling my wife, like, I don't know, like, I should pick up a hobby or something because I'm bored out of my mind right now. Um, and for some reason, I, I remember basketball cards, and I looked through my stuff, and I had my stuff from, like, 20 years ago, and they were worth pretty pretty much nothing now uh, because they were just like overpopulated um junk wax and i started searching on ebay and i started buying stuff and that's really how it took off um in 2018 the wax the boxes were still relatively cheap um so just by boxing and, and breaking open packs i just those just went up in value you know even though breaking you know breaking boxes it's like the worst thing you can do as, in terms of investment point but i got i got really lucky just going in in 2018 breaking boxes and uh, just those naturally went up in prices and um just from those profit alone i was able to like build my collection over time um so i mean staying disciplined was the hardest thing 
Um, yeah. Not buying what I can afford. Yep. Yeah. I mean, not a bad year to be breaking boxes. Uh, Luca's rookie year. Um, you can't you yeah. can't really go wrong there. I, I mean, back then that was when boxes were actually affordable. I mean, you were buying boxes of of Prism for what two hundred bucks, something like that. Exactly. Um, and yep. I mean, not like today drops a, a hobby box at, at two thousand, so twenty uh, x the value, which is I mean ten x the value, which is just bananas. Um, but that how much it is right now? Yeah, yeah. 20, I think twenty one Prism boxes. Yeah, it's 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 Jesus. It's nuts. I'd even check. Yeah, so that that was uh, that was the the release price from panini themselves uh they dropped the boxes at 2k um for a hobby box so uh it's pretty funny i, I love the story when doma tells me that he went to a, a card show here way back and i think it was uh what two what would yeah nikola Jokic year and you bought a, a prism hobby box for 220 australian dollars uh which you know probably about 150 us which is uh just nuts because i looked up that price of that box i couldn't actually find the hobby box but i uh, found like a retail box and that was going for about three thousand <laughs> U.S. So <laughs> that's that right. That Nikola Jokic is worth it. It was worth it. I got Jokic, so which I don't have anymore, which I probably should have kept, but it doesn't matter. But this, that's the hobby. You just don't know when price rises. I don't like collecting Jokic, so I moved that card on. But you did. That's just that's just the hobby. That's the game, really. Like it can fluctuate and vary, like on a daily basis with NBA. That is, uh, it's which is insane. Now. You said you had some strategies, as you said, when you're collecting cards. Um, do you go more for numbered? Because you've got one of the most impressive, oh, impressive <laughs> uh, collections. Uh, I'll get into some of the other things you collect in a moment. But when it comes to NBA and basketball cards, well, wow, like you got some really nice cards. So what are your strategies when you're collecting cards? But what sets do you like to collect? I've seen some sick cards you got here, downtowns and yeah, some patches. Yep, sure, sure. Um, I... I'm a collector first. Uh, I started as a collector. Um, I started not even thinking about investing at all in 2018, right? So um, I did some research online and I wanted to just pick up, pick one product that I wanted to collect. And um, that became the 2016-17 studio product. So uh, it was discontinued. Um, it was introduced in some Chronicle products, as you know. Uh, over the years, 2018, 2019, and 2020. Uh, I just liked it because of the design. Just, just the design caught my eyes, and I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to collect. So in 2018, I just started buying all the base cards, uh, all the inserts, and then you know, as I made profit over time, I started buying number cards, um, just building up and up and up over time. Um, so that's my foundation of collection, 2016-17 uh, studio product. Um, and then I, in 2019, I started venturing over to other stuff because there's so much collection, like so so many selections out there. Um, and then I started looking into like the prospect rookies, like Luca, um, Trey Youngs, and I got really excited because of all the price jumps that that was happening. Um, so so I was dabbling on some rookies, but you know I sold so many Lucas that I haven't that, that I shouldn't have sold back in 2018. You know, um, but just it, it was all hindsight. I mean, um, but yeah, I, I I can show you right now the studio cards that I collect. Uh, for example, like this is my this is probably my favorite card out of my collection. So this is the uh, Kobe Bryant uh, studio. It's a base parallel um, nice. number to 15. And the special uh, special thing about this card is this product only made one parallel. And this is the only parallel that came out of that product. So it's either this or a gold one of one. Wow. Um, that's why I liked it a lot because if you look at Prism nowadays, there's like thousands of variations. Yeah, you can get this. I think there's like five different colors. More after more. the base, it just silver. goes nuts. Or, yeah. Yeah. They even added Orange, more yeah. this pink, year. Whatever. Oh, did they? Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. But but yeah. one of the cards I really do like out of that studio set, and I'm a big 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 fan of uh, the downtown cards, and I love them. And you've got oh, a nice. 2016 studio uh, PSA 10 uh, Kobe. Now you know what when I went through on your page and through your collection that you've put up on Instagram, I've never seen this card before. So 
I got really excited when I saw. It. I just I just love the downtown cards, and uh, as I said to to source that many times, it's like when was the first time you saw it? Uh, when source mentioned that you were jumping on, so probably about a week. That was the after. first time you saw that card. Yeah, I didn't know oh, that. Wow, for me, like the first okay because I always go through because. I've never seen anything like that listed on eBay or anywhere. So I'm like going through it. I'm like, oh, and I saw Panini Studio because I know that obviously you can get downtowns and cornerstones and one on one. So I'm pretty sure Chronicles has got it as well downtown. Mm, yeah. yeah yep, so I, I saw Studio and I'm like, oh. Oh, Chronicles. I I don't know about Chronicles. Yeah. Do they have downtowns now? No, we're not sure. I mean, I mean, maybe they might do it, but right. I mean, last year they okay. they put it in their one and one set. Um, that was yeah, and then the previous year they, they were, that was in cornerstones. But when I saw cornerstones, studio, court yeah. kings, uh, court King. I think they were in uh, prism draft picks for college yes. stuff. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You can get Zion and um, Jar and all those yep. guys coming yep. out of uh, college. But yeah, so studio. I'm like, that's another sick card. So you, that's your variation. In your collection, I know. By the way, that downtown was the very first downtown. There you go. There you go. 2016, that was yep. the first downtown set, and they dropped it in the studio, which is um yep. probably I I reckon part of the reason why you like the studio because I mean that's that's downtowns are sick. I think they're awesome cards, and they are super super rare. Even though they're not numbered, they are rare, um you know, and and hard to find. So. Yeah, it was a big part of the reason why I chose the studio products for sure. Yeah, definitely. So obviously you've got patches and autos as well. And this is probably a discussion that John and I maybe haven't had uh, for a while. But we seem to like not understand like the way minds are obviously ticking sometimes in the hobby. And, you know, we people were more going for oh, a rookie base or a rookie parallel. So John and I always used to say, wouldn't you want a piece of somebody's jersey like in a patch or like a patch auto or just an auto like we're getting their signature that's probably better than a base variant like a, a parallel card so yeah i think patches are super underrated <laughs> yeah so what's your thoughts on that i've, I've got one because i got your page up in front of me so i'm just scrolling through and i can see you got a cornerstones Giannis uh quad quad patch auto number to 10 like that's a sick looking card mm -hmm. like that is awesome. you know how much i got that for how much 500 bucks <laughs> see you know what i mean like that's a nice card yeah it was you know, so 500 cheap. Bucks. i was like thank you i'll take it <laughs> go get a luca base for whatever it is <laughs> he's rookie it's insane. Yeah. yeah yeah so i mean it's an it's an attached auto on card too I mean, it is an on card it's very very nice so what's your what's your thoughts around that when it comes to autos and patches um i do like autos i don't like sticker autos um it just doesn't have the same appeal as the on card autos, um, but I, I'm not a big auto patch collector though. To be honest with you, yeah, uh, yeah. When you said ser like uh, like short printed numbers, like serial number cards, I I agree with with that. I, I'm a huge fan of that, like short prints. Um, that's a, that's why I'm a huge fan of select. Yeah. So when I when I buy cards, I buy a lot of select cards, um, because. I think, you know, somebody else said this before, but I, I really believe that Select is going to be the next Prism. You know, Select is going to be the next um, <laughs> premium product that's going to overtake Prism because I, it just looks better to me. It just pops a lot, like pops more, um, like it shines more too in some yeah. of the silver Prisms. And, you know, you asked about, you know, what my strategy is when, when it comes to, cards other than my collection for studio uh you know i can give you an example so like back in march 2019 i think or march 2020 uh i looked at i i used the market mover from sportscardinvestor.com yep yep so you guys know about that right yep. so yep yep i used that tool to to find the cards that have depreciated the most in the last 90 days and I, I go from top to bottom. And, you know, if it's like a Scotty Pippen after Jordan, you know, documentary, I'm like, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense why it's going down. So I go to the next player. Um, I see Ray Allen, right? I'm like, yeah, I mean, not many people are collecting Ray Allen or investing in Ray Allen. 
what's next? And I see Jalen Brown at the time. And what I did was I, I went into YouTube and started watching his plays, his highlights, what he can do on the offensive side, what he can do on the defensive side. And I just did my eye test. You know what I mean? So I, I saw he has all, all the arsenals in terms of shooting, dribbling, passing. He can do everything he can, uh, that Jason Tatum can. Um, in my eyes, that's what I thought at the time. And I looked at the stats, uh, you go to basketballreference.com and uh, looked up his stats over the years. It was his averages were increasing every single year. You know, his points were increasing by like five points every year. Um, assists, rebound, his field goal percentage, everything was going up. And I was like, wait, why is this guy's cards going down in price? It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so that's when I decided to jump on on Jalen Brown cards. Um, so that's basically my, my strategy. Use my eye test, look at the internet. Uh, the last thing is like in the news, in the media, what's, what's everybody saying about Jalen Brown? Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of like my process when it comes to investing. I like it. I like yeah. it a lot. Now, outside of NBA, you obviously collect some other stuff. Um, so what do you collect first and foremost? And I think we'll get into a yeah. bit of a discussion about one of the types of cards because we haven't really discussed it much. But um, yeah, so what, what else do you collect next to basketball? I started collecting po- Pokemon a little bit. I, I dabbled on that a little bit, but I, I lost interest over time because the prices were just going insane. And I think I got in a little bit late. Um, yeah. So I was I, I was getting a little bit discouraged by all the prices. I felt like I was buying too high. Um, so I quickly pivoted over to something else that I thought was underrated. And it was a trading card game that I used to play when I was a kid, which is Yu-Gi-Oh. So prices on Yu-Gi-Oh's compared to Pokemon right now is uh, the gap is really big. And, and I think that gap is going to close and it has been closing already. Um, and I, I'll show you one here. Um, this one is probably my most expensive Yu-Gi-Oh card that I have. It's this one. You might, you might not have any idea what this card is, but, um, now I don't have any idea what it is. I don't know source yep. if you have any idea what it is. Now this is, this is what we love. So we want you to give an insight to viewers and listeners into the Yu-Gi-Oh uh, space. Uh, what do these people like our listeners, and what do we all need to look for when we start collecting Yu-Gi-Oh cards, or want to come into Yu-Gi-Oh to collect? Yeah, I'm I'm still learning too, but I, yeah. I I think I'm at least a little bit knowledgeable to to tell you some stuff. Unlike Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh cards heavily depend on the playability of the card. So if the card is quote unquote meta, meaning it's um, a lot of people play because it's good. It's uh, superior to other cards. Yeah, it gives you the advantage over the other player. Um, so that's the biggest. That's one of the biggest component of the card price. Um, and the other thing is rarity, which is the same as basketball or Pokemon. The this one that I showed you is kind of like a case hit. It's really uh, hard okay. to hit. Yeah, so you only get one every that's like thirty That's the first edition boxes. I see. And the first edition too. So yeah, all the all the cars that I'm buying are either first edition or limited editions. I so like I, it. I, I like it. Yeah. Unless is it's a uh, vintage, I almost never buy an unlimited copy because Yu-Gi-Oh! It's it's still very affordable to get first edition cards. It definitely is. Now we we spoke about this on another podcast with another guest of ours, and then we spoke about it. Uh, on another another podcast and we gave um, a tip to our listeners and viewers and it was based on what we were seeing like some of the people here in Australia that are very well known and connected to people over in the States mm-hmm. so obviously they in their circles they'd been discussing now we gave three three cards and call me crazy if if I'm wrong but two two of them as far as I can see you have in your collection so, which is good. The third one, so it's Dark Magician, which you have in your collection. Mm-hmm. Red Eyes, Black, Dra- Black Dragon, which you have in your collection. 
And the last one is obviously the most popular is uh, the Blue Eyes White Dragon. I'm talking about the original set, that is. Uh, I didn't oh, see. Oh, yes. you bought it? You no, one? no, no. So oh. these are the three cards that we're telling people are the most popular from the original set. Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. Obviously, Blue it was, Eyes, definitely, yep. Because it was Kaiba, Yugi, and Joey Wheeler's main uh, mon- dual monsters to play. So that was that was our theory behind it. Uh, I think it, it does have some merit because they are very popular cards. Now, you've got a few other things in there, and it now makes sense to me why, when it comes to like meta cards, uh, you do have a Lord D Dragon in there, Lord Dragon card that you've collected. And now, if people don't understand, I, I've done a bit of research into this, so... If you get him with his flute in the game, it calls the blue eyes out onto the field automatically. So yeah. it's not very playable nowadays. It's yeah, not it's not good yeah. enough to be played today, but it's it's just a iconic card from the back in the days. So yeah, from nostalgia factor alone, that's just yeah, that's so why I invested in that one. If you had to project, I know because the hobby is a lot of projecting. Mm-hmm. If you had to project Yu Gi Oh's timeline into popularity. How long do you reckon before everyone starts jumping on that Yu-Gi-Oh bandwagon like Pokemon? Would you give it? I think it'll. I think it'll take a little bit more time than Pokemon did because uh, I figured out that the the landscape of Yu-Gi-Oh is mostly guys right now. There there are not that many girls. Um, it's mostly guys. It's basically a sausage uh, fest right now. <laughs> <laughs> When um, Pokemon, on the other hand, there are so many females involved. Like, we may not see them collecting, like, there are some, social yeah. media or whatnot. But I know by going to Comic Con events and stuff like that here over here in Australia, we've got so many other. We've got Comic Con, another one called Supernova. Um, there is a lot of female collectors in in Pokemon, which is awesome, and that gives it more of a space to grow uh, as a TCG. So that is a massive, massive factor, and I completely agree with you with that. If that's what it is at the moment in Yu-Gi-Oh, well, until yeah. it grows... It's changing, bit- though. It's changing. I'm seeing more female um, uh, social media platforms for Yu-Gi-Oh, so um, it'll happen over time. I think it'll be a steady growth. It, it won't be like a spike that we saw in Pokemon, um, but you know, as an investor, a steady growth is always good. Also, we all yep. we don't know, uh, you know. All it needs is uh, the lads from Card Talk Pod to just uh, drop, start dropping it, and uh, that could really, really speed up the process. So, I mean, yeah. if you're listening to this right now, and, and Jay's sitting there, he's done some research, and he's telling you that, um, you know, first edition cards are still quite affordable. I mean, your ears should perk up, and maybe you should start uh, going to. Uh, uh, ebay and, and and google and start searching up and and finding out um you know what you want to collect and then you know picking up a few pieces because uh you know the the entry point at this uh time is very very low so your, your risk to reward i think is uh super high uh, would you agree with that point jay i do i do i definitely um when one thing becomes really expensive, you start looking for alternatives, right? Yeah. And that's naturally what just happened for me here, uh, because. But I gotta, I gotta mention though, it's, it's really you gotta buy what you like, though. Yes. Yes. Well, that's At what I said. Time. That's what I said. You know, yeah. doing your research yeah. into the sets and buying what you like. Yeah. But also, you know, if you're sticking to some of the original sets from way back, what twenty years ago, and buying the first edition stuff, I mean, and you're getting. You know, decent grades, nines and tens. I think you'd want to be sticking to around that. Um, I I think you really can't go wrong. Uh, you know, you got to think. If you like the card, you can't go yeah, wrong. Yeah, that's right. Because even if it goes down in value, you 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 like it in your you collection. You like the card. Right? So I mean, Jay yeah. speaking like a true collector here, like a true collector, He's buying what you like. Um, yeah, I like it. I like it. Um, all right. So moving on. Um, now. You, I see he's, he's we've spoken about poke, Pokemon and, and you moved on from that. Um, all right. So there's one interesting aspect uh, to. I I do buy I do buy some Pokemon still. Though. Okay. <laughs> look, the, look, the prices yeah. have softened on that some of that stuff. Uh, we've seen the crazy run up on it, and um, the prices have softened. So, um, it's you know it could be a point to to entry. Um, I still think that that Pokemon company still has something plan for the 25th 
anniversary. I just don't think that what they're doing with the Pokemon um, in the Happy Meals, that's not all they had planned. Like I just, It'll be a media. Yeah, it just sure. it just doesn't make sense that that would be the only thing that they've got. And I think we're going to see another price spike. So maybe there could be a buying opportunity for people. Isn't, isn't there a 25th anniversary product coming out? Yeah, well, that's the rumor. Uh, well, okay. It usually comes out mid-year. So when it was its the 20th anniversary of Pokemon, I got my hands on the Japanese uh, product that they released, which then they um, <laughs> retitled Evolutions, and they uh, said, that's the English version of the 20th anniversary, but it's actually not. It's just a product that they put in existence, and they literally remade the, the base set in evolutions and everyone's yep. like oh nostalgia but on the japanese product it genuinely says on the box like it's a first i got a first edition box which i ripped i got a charizard out of it which i was nice. pretty happy nice. but literally it says on the box yeah it says pokemon it says 20th anniversary on the box and then it has the art and then on the packs i even kept the pack uh one of the the wax packs i, I open but i just like to keep them so we get to see what they look like going mm-hmm. forward but even that uh has 20th anniversary on it so it was actually marketed as a 20th anniversary product with obviously all the the logos and stuff but then when it came over to to america australia just an english v- version of the product it was just titled evolutions and everyone said this is the 20th anniversary well technically it's not you oh, can take it at, you, you oh, can take okay. it you can say yes it is because it, it mirrors the 20th anniversary Japanese. But it doesn't have that, that 20th anniversary no. marking on it. So it's, no. yeah. So yeah. that that's the thing that's... I mean, and, and we keep telling people like, you know, the price of XY Evolutions, the way it's gone, and it doesn't actually specify that it's 20th anniversary. Um, the Japanese version, which actually tells you it's 20th anniversary, um, and it was advertised as 20th anniversary, the cards are still super affordable, aren't they, Dom? Yeah, so the funny thing is when you... They are extremely affordable. Now, the funny thing is if you go grade the, that Evolutions thing uh, set, as I, I just said, it'll say Evolutions on there. But fortunately enough, uh, viewers and listeners, because I've got the Charizard and I got it graded, you actually see, Jay, the way that they've put the description on there. It's 2016, oh, okay. but it says 20th GGC, anniversary. Nice. And it says... Yeah, thanks, man. And it says 20th anniversary set show us the grade Dominic, because you kept that card in good nick you you pulled it five years ago in a pack solid grade and got the nine five and cgc are very very tough on grading so that that is solid the best thing about this card as i keep saying to everyone the best thing about this card it's still very affordable if you go to buy a raw next to the evolutions one from the the same set in the english version which is probably triple the value to quadruple the 4x this but the best Mm -hmm. thing about this card is if you can find one I don't know if it's going to come up on here. Sorry for podcast listeners. It's got a first edition stamp right there. It says there. first edition at the bottom. There's a the little cup. first edition um, uh, print so on the bottom. That's the thing oh, I keep right. telling everyone. Like, it's super affordable still. Don't go buy Evolutions. Buy the Japanese. And this was going to lead into a question I had for you because you, you've you actually got some original base set Pokemon um, and you've got Japanese variants of the card. Now, did you go into collecting those because they were more affordable at the time than just the English version of the product? Or is it because you just think that the Japanese cards look better? Imper- they, yeah, so it's just a personal preference? or Yeah, it was two reasons. The first one was it was basically the OG, you could call it a rookie card, because it was basically the very first one that ever came out. And people treat the English version as the the very first one, right? But it's really not. And if you look at the population count, Japanese versions are much lower because nobody really graded graded those. So I mean, rarity like the there's a lot less of them out there. So the supply is very limited. And also at the same time, it like it gives you that feeling like, oh my gosh, I own something that was like first time ever printed, right? So. Um, it was really affordable too at the time. At the time, so I just liked it. I was like, I'm gonna pick up some of these, you know, in in, in any condition. Yeah, definitely. No, I, I have. I like 1996. That. <laughs> 1996. 
exactly right. And the whole thing is, uh, you hit the nail on the head with that with that statement. It actually is the true rookie of the Charizard is the Japanese set, just yeah. like the true rookie of my Charizard that I just showed was the true rookie of that year's Charizard that came out on a reprint. But that's the true rookie. It it should be wherever the product drops first. It dropped in Jap- Japan first. Like that, this is the first time you get to see it. So. If people what, haven't caught on yet, what did so. you guys hear about why the Japanese are underrated compared to the English versions? So I I just heard the main because consensus of the language. we've had from people when we've <laughs> asked people is because people want to understand the card, what they're looking at, and I just nobody think, reads it though. Yeah. <laughs> Jay, thank you. Thank you. That's exactly what I say. I say people are <laughs> buying, getting these cards and they're putting it on a mantelpiece for the art. No one cares about the damage. No one cares about what it actually... Like, no one's going to a tournament or going to their mate's house and pulling out their PSA slab cards or the CGC slab <laughs> Charizard and playing the TCG. No one is. Like, this is, this is, it. you know, th- like... It's good to see that we've got someone in our same wavelength that thinks like that the Japanese and look n- not for anything like you know I cracked I opened a bit of Japanese stuff uh, last year and I've opened English uh, products and I just think the Japanese cards they look better I the back of the card I like the I like the gold border on the back of the card I think it looks better on the on the modern cards I don't know if it's the same from the older cards if it, but yeah I just think they look better so I mean. I'm all for uh, uh, like the Japanese and and even like some of the some of the, the other some other anime things like I'm I'm into you know the Japanese uh, stuff and and when you get deep into like uh, you know uh, watching uh, anime and, and things and you go past the dub version and you're that eager you just start watching the uh, non dub version with subtitles so uh, like it, it it doesn't bother me I, I I no one reads the card I just we don't understand it I don't understand it um, but you know, by all means, everyone keep pumping up the English prices because, you know, that allows me to buy some stuff for my collection of the Japanese stuff, which I think looks better overall um, for a cheaper price. So, I mean, it, do- it doesn't bother me at this point, but I just think there's going to be a point where people realize that the the Japanese, uh, there's less being graded. Um, so therefore, you know, the rarity on, on those uh, at a higher grades is, is going to demand a, a premium at some point. Um, and when yeah. when that English stuff starts to get ridiculously out of hand, people are going to go to the next best thing, which is the Japanese. So I think we'll, we'll see slowly the Japanese uh, rising up in price and uh, hopefully one day, you know, competing with the English set because there's no reason for it to not be um, competing at the same level when it's the same card. And and no one's reading the card. Let's let's be honest. I think, I think that that's the a very flawed argument. Um, but you know, it's the it's the consensus we've had when we've asked people, uh, you know, that mm-hmm. collect Pokemon, and then that was I'll, literally the answer. I'll, I'll give you a good idea of like I'll just use the twentieth anniversary Charizard as the example here yeah? because let's be honest, we're not going to go out there and you may or you may not if you're watching and listening be able to afford the original first edition Charizard. Yeah, if you can, by all means, all right, it's gone, it's slowly going up in value. It may go down a bit, but I reckon that's a good buy. If you can afford that, I'm not... But the next best thing is go on eBay and just pick up a PSA 9 first edition Charizard Holo, the one I just showed, $400. Now, if I type in the Evolutions Charizard, that would be over $1,000. So Evolutions... Charizard. Uh, where are we? Hey PSA. Dom, which 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 card is the four hundred dollar one? The Japanese one the, or the, the Japanese? So a PSA nine of of the one of, of the, that one. Okay. Yeah, and it has right. first edition. So here's a good one for you. Uh, PSA nine of this exact same card in the evolutions. The English version massively, of the card. Massively, massively, massively overprinted. Not the first edition, and they did release more print. They did uh, more. Yeah, more they... product got released into to Walmart and Target last year. Um, more booster um, ETBs and stuff. So, um, yeah, they did reprint. So you can get a PSA nine for four hundred, but you the PSA ten of this card is seventeen hundred USD. The the population difference is 
what's the gap there? Do you know? It's pretty big, right? I'm I reckon sure. it'd be ginormous because this is a first edition card. So once the first edition's done with Japanese, it, it works the same as the English yeah. uh, variant. Yeah. Once the first edition's done, that's it. Then it just becomes unlimited print. So I don't know. It's just one of those things. That's just an example. I'm not saying, well, you can go buy one of those cards. I reckon it's a good investment because it looks good. Let, let's be honest. By the way, Charizards nowadays may be underrated now. Maybe there, there, there may be some opportunities now because it, it has cooled off a lot since, yeah, since I completely uh, a couple agree. months ago. I completely yeah. agree with you. It's like, yeah, he has cooled off massively, massively. So, yeah, yeah it could be a buy. Uh, just obviously, as we say, do your research and, yeah, before you you buy anything. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's our take on that. But the next thing I've got for you is... Uh, it could get John a bit fired up. Do you, do you, look, just before we move on, Dom, and I am going to go, I am going to sure. have a uh, have a uh, look here. I mean, it does seem to be so. They've th- this is the the Japanese twentieth uh, uh, anniversary Japanese expansion. I'm looking at the PSA pop report. There's um, a total graded of the first edition Hollow Charizard, uh, which is uh, this total graded. I mean. I believe the card probably grade better. So three thousand one hundred and sixteen total graded, and there's like two thousand five hundred fifty five pop on the ten. On the flip side, the Japanese on the Japanese on the flip side, okay. there's ten thousand uh, four hundred and thirty five graded in the English version, and there is two hundred and fifteen on the pop report of ten. So just that would show me that probably the Japanese cards are probably printed a lot more cleaner than the uh oh English yes version. i do remember this yeah that's why the psa 10 population on the english version is so low right yeah because it's i mean there's six thousand two hundred and fifty uh fifty four nines and then on the flip side for yeah. the japanese there's only 466 nines so i reckon it's sense. just it's got to do with a printing thing that it's probably printed a lot uh, so, so what you're saying to me source is if i sent this to psa i would have got a 10 yeah, you're pretty much guaranteed a ten. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> now that brings us to our next uh, our next question for our grading cards. Obviously, massive conversation in this hobby. It is huge. Uh, what's your take on it? Uh, I think PSA is king right now. Definitely, I, I think everybody knows that. Um, I really, I'm really disappointed by what BGS is doing in terms of business. Uh, SGC was just a letdown. Everybody knows. Um, they they failed so many of us who jumped on the boat many months ago. Uh, but I guess there are other companies coming up right now, right? But I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for PSA to reopen right now. I'm not. I'm not eager to to submit to BGS or SGC at this point for my sports cards. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, you got a you got a business background, so I want to delve into this a little bit deeper for people that are listening, um, because we've if you've listened to our podcast, we always we go in pretty hard on grading companies. Yeah. No one is really safe except for HGA at the moment because they seem to be doing the right things in terms of customer service. Yeah. And their turnaround times is all good. I understand they're new, and a lot of people don't want to trust them. But as John and I have said, they haven't got enough cards on the market at the moment to get a real indication of how well they're doing against competitors. But now that we are getting uh, that, uh, well, that surplus of cards out on the market and actually holding up against the BGS and they're starting to push like a PSA 9 a bit, you know what I mean? It's like, okay, yeah, they might not be better than BGS or PSA down the long run, but the customer service is what is driving people through the door. And they got really nice looking slabs, obviously the customization, so they've been able to market that really well. So what's your thoughts on, on the business aspect side of things for PSA and for BGS? Um, they are the two big dogs. Uh, as you know, they've closed, uh, PSA is closed for three months. So the way PSA is marketed compared to BGS is marketing, for example. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I just don't see BGS out there enough. Uh, I don't think they're doing enough. Uh, all I see are some emails. Because I'm subscribed to their email uh, subscription, uh, I know they still do those magazines. I think with price yeah, guides. Yeah, yeah. 
it, nobody reads them. I mean, it's not even helpful to be honest with you. Um, I, I feel like the, I, I think if you if you bring it down to micro level, let's say there's five PSA tens, and then there's five BGS of LeBron James Top Chrome 2003 rookie card base, right? What's going to happen is there's PSA tens and BGS 9.5s, right? So, I mean, I you could say like three of them are going to look at the cards and say, I think this this can cross. You know what I mean? They're going to crack it open. They're going to send it over to, the, over to PSA. And now there's eight PSA and there's two BGS left. Yeah. Right? And those two BGS, let's say, it's selling for less than half of the PSA 10s now, which is, which is true, actually, if you look at the, the comparisons right now. They're going to sell, uh, flip, sell, flip. Prices are going to keep going down. Eventually, you're going to see the population of BGS cards going down. Because... Do, you think, do you think if that's the case with the BGS population going down and then potentially them... Well, we're, just, we're just literally... We're doing the work for them right now, what the three of us are about to do. So if that happens and, we, and BGS goes, well, now we're going to start marketing better, offer a better customer service... And they improve their brand because the pop is so low on their slabs. Will it, in turn, maybe work effectively for them in the long run? But that's if they improve their procedures at the moment, which is pretty I, poor. I hope they do. I really hope they react. That's what I'm hoping for because I want them to compete. Right? I don't want a PSA monopoly because they can just do whatever they want with their prices, and that sucks on on us. You know what I mean? Like, hundred percent. We have. Yeah, we have to pay three hundred dollars a card to submit to PSA right now, and that's just not ideal. It's not cool, you know. No, so, no. Yeah, no. that's why I stopped submitting the PSA. The it's just not worth it for me, you know. Um, but I think BGS needs to listen. I don't think they're listening. You know, I think over the, like so many years, I think people have been complaining how like bulky they are, you know, like how the corners are too sharp. Um, like it's not IG friendly because you know it's really hard to take photos of the cards inside BGS if you real uh, if you um, if you realize that because of the sleeve that's inside is like always almost warping. So it okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, Source yeah, it you reflects had that issue. the light in a weird way, so it's hard to take like good pictures of it. Oh, okay. Cause, like, yeah, because what what everybody wants to do is flex. Like flex yeah. on IG, right? Like I got this card and like, you know, like take a picture, but it's like it's hard to take photos of it. Um, and they just love their quad price, uh, quad, the quad gradings. I, I I don't know. I maybe they it's it's better to just stay with the the subgrades, but um, maybe they need to move away from that. I don't know. They're just not doing anything, you know. I think yeah, I think that's... they should do something. Sauce, you want to explode? You're ready oh, to look. You know, I, I, I don't look. I've had a few conversations with Jay uh, in yeah. in the DMs about, about you know cracking slabs and, and all that sort of thing, sending to PSA, and the the majority of look, the, the I feel like the majority of people like it's uh you know although there might be personal preference on some of this, like a lot of it's money driven, uh where they're cracking slabs and seeing over because they know they can get more money for PSA and rightfully so. I mean, I, I guess everyone does want to get the most out of their investments as we're going towards and this. their collection too. Yeah, well. Yeah, they, everyone wants their collection to be valued uh, at a higher rate, uh, whether it be, you know, at some point you want to move some of those cards on and, and be able to buy a bigger Grail card or you need to sell some of those cards to pay for some expenses in real life. And, you know, by putting it in a PSA slab, you're going to generate an extra, you know, now what uh, was once a extra 30 to 40%. I mean, on some cards, it's an extra hundred percent. You're gonna, you, you're, you're doubling the value of the BGS card, um, which is, it's pretty sad that it's gotten to this point. But Jay is not wrong. It's, it's, it's gone to this point because of their lack of innovation or their lack of change uh, that that's that hasn't happened. You know, they just they've just failed on all fronts. You know, whether it be on their marketing, whether it be on, um, you know, doing something different with their their label. Um, I mean, I spoke about this, you know, everyone, 
values BGS cards differently. You know, if it's got a 10 in the subgrade, you know, people want to charge more. If it's got all 9.5s on, on, you know, and it's a true gem, you know, people want to uh, value it more. Um, you know, and I've spoken about this and I've said, well, what happens if they never had subgrades? No one would know any better and you'd just be, be paying for the grade that's on top, the big, you know, the big number. And, um, you know, although it would be drastic and that's probably their niche, you know, because the fact that they've got subgrades, I think that, you know, it's 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 an option that they could have, you know, they, they should maybe potentially put up their pricing for subgrades because subgrades takes longer, you know, for, for the people to, to, to do their graders. So maybe it's like, all right, you want, really want subgrades. It's not like an extra $5. It's like an extra $20 or something like that. Um, and then you would see more people subbing and just, you know, uh, getting the non subgraded uh, cards and maybe that will help them. But also their lack of marketing, which is just, just been poor, you know, they been haven't, very poor. you know, and look, and I'm, I'm here sitting on the fence going like, you know, I can understand where PSA is at, but I'm not going to also say that PSA's grading is the best grading. Like it's just factually wrong. You like their grading of cards is no better than, than BGS. So I'm not, I'm not going to say that, you know, PSA yeah, is it's better. inconsistent all over the place. Right. Yeah. yeah. And like, I mean, and you see inconsistencies across all, all companies, but I like the fact that BGS tens are really rare. Like, you know, I think that's the way cards should be graded. You know, it shouldn't be so easy to get a, a, a 10. And now we are, you know, hearing whispers from people who grade thousands of cards a week, um, you know, on cards that they were getting 10s on 12 months ago at PSA. They're not getting 10s on anymore. You know, they're getting back, you know, they get back a their thousand cards. And before, you know, 80% of them were 10s. Now that's like only 30 to 40% of them are 10s. Um, so what are PSA doing? Like they, they, they stole the market with their great marketing. They stole the market with, you know, handing out tens like, uh, candy. And then now they're retracing some of that back, um, because they realize, oh, we've got the market. So we actually need to rein in our grading and give yeah. less tens. Limit the population of tens. Yeah. So <laughs> I mean, and that's exactly what Jay was saying. Like they got that much monopoly. You don't want it to get to a point where they can do whatever they want. Exactly. They can dictate yeah. us however we they they so please. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And and their marketing and well, their marketing was decent, PSA. I'm not gonna say it was amazing. It was the their marketing was decent enough to what they put into place, literally the marketing created itself. Like they got a couple well known people. Uh it was really yeah. simple. Yeah. If you want yeah. to explain what you saw as well, like, oh yeah, I mean, just a couple of celebrities, players, you know, mentioning PSA on Instagram. I mean, that was really all all they needed. I mean, StockX partnership. Um, uh, what else did they do? Uh, I mean, they're a lot more active on social media on Instagram yeah. than BGS is. I mean, it's just simple stuff. I mean, there's no reason not to be on IG these days anymore. You know. Like you rarely BGS go on IG and posting anything. It's just like emails. I'm like, dude, this is 2021. <laughs> I'll, I'll be on, like, this is going to be sound ridiculous. And I've, I've mentioned it before, but if the train keeps going this way, yeah, and BGS just like do nothing and they stay as they are at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've taken in everything. I'm, t I'm talking about customer service, slabs. I'm talking about uh, their social media presence. Uh, their transparency on social media, how well they can deal with issues if something does arise. They're willing to get, give money back and process a whole order for someone. Source knows exactly where I'm going with this. But by the end of the year, if BGS does nothing, and based on the way that the market's looking, HGA will be the second best grading company behind PSA in the world. I was going to say that. I was going to say that. I that like their it. slabs. Yeah, well, I mean, they, that, they, they're looking at you know, and I'm not sure how you've followed, um, if you've followed them, Jay, but we've followed them from the beginning and, and Tyler's actually the CEO of the company. He's come on the show and, and spoken to us and it was, it's, you know, it's one of our, it is our highest viewed show and listened to show. Um, and, you know, 
he nice. has gone on uh, recently to uh, Luca Tiger's Bronze podcast and spoken again, uh, and that was the second interview he's been on there with, and he spoke about um, them, you know, his plans for the yeah. future, yeah. and and I mean the the, the transparency with the company is unbelievable. Um, and you know, he's even doing things where he's answering, you know, doing live videos, the CEO and, and not live videos, but you know, answering questions that he gets in his Facebook group. And so, you know, he, he is serving to the collectors. So the collectors requested, uh, for instance, one thing is like, you know, horizontal cards. Is it ever, ever, is it ever bugged you when you grade a horizontal card that the labels actually, you know, on the edge and it's not, you know, on the top. Well, he's actually gone and, 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 because people have, have wanted it and he's going to create a horizontal uh, label that's going to go across the top of the card so it's the same way as the card. So you, you look at the card and you can read the label. You don't have to turn your head on the side to read the label. Now, you know, Very nice. he's nice. doing all of these things because he wants to serve the collectors um, and, you know, he's he said, you know, with PSA shutdown, like, you know, we could have opened our doors, but we open our doors, we're going to get flooded with cards and we're going to be in a position that we don't want to be in. You know, we want to meet our turnaround times. We're doing stuff differently. And, you know, he said on the most recent Luca Tiger Bronze podcast that they looking at, um, you know, by, um, you know, in a few months time to be able to be accepting, uh, not a few months time, but like, you know, by the end of the year, being able to accept 30,000 cards a week, um, and also open an office in Australia and in Canada. Uh, I mean, if they are also the first grading company to open an international office, which is something that I've been saying for 12 months, you know, why these grading companies live in their own little bubble when there's such mar big markets outside of America, um, you know, what would happen if you did create an office in Australia and everyone who sends cards to Australia, you know, just one group subber here is sending 4,000 cards a, a month, right? That's just one group subber of PSA and that's, you know, there's other, there's a, all, there's a few different services. So, you know, you combine all those, that could be somewhat to around 15,000 cards to 20,000 cards a month just coming from Australia. Now, if you opened up an office and PSA or your grading company, for instance, PSA didn't have to take 20,000 cards coming from Australia per month and you could just grade them in Australia and serve the Australian market and then potentially serve the, you know, Asia, well, Asian Asia, market as well. Like we've listened to Carvin. I don't, I'm not sure if you're aware of Carvin Chung. He used to work for Upper Deck We've listened to him a lot on Clubhouse. And he, so many stories that John and I have listened to is like how big some of the collect, collectors are in, in Asia, like China, Hong Kong. You know what I mean? Like just Oh, absolute, they're huge. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I follow some of them on Instagram. Yeah, insane, insane collections, yeah. Mm -hmm. And John and I are thinking to ourselves, how is there no serviceability just for like the, the Asia Oceania market? Like, they would get as many cards as oh, yeah, for sure. just a, a, a North America office. Like, yeah. that's the crazy thing. So, so yeah, go H for it. HGA, look, and that's why we think HGA, if they expand on, on the way their timeline goes, they've just opened up a new facility to move all of their grading over to just the facility. And then one facility is where you, uh, it's just admin stuff um and you know they're looking to expand they ex they're expanding to six to ten employees per week um and i think they're at like 80 employees and they did start with 10 or something like that so you know if they keep going at this timeline and they and they keep their customer service which is just brilliant like the, and the way they're just so transparent with their customers um and the way they're able to push themselves across social media i'm like when 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 tyler you know, came out and, 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 um, you know, bought the collectors and the card community hybrid grading approach. He was pretty much on every podcast I could think of. He was, you know, tell me what podcast are BGS going on. Like they, they go on one and it's once in every, Zero. oh no, they go on <laughs> one guy's podcast. I've seen it. I've seen them on there twice and, you know, and that's twice in two, in, in 12 months. Right. Um, you mean Mr. Beckett? Yeah, I mean, they go on some guy's podcast. I don't know if it's Mr. Beckett himself podcast. I don't know. So, I okay, mean, that yeah. might he, be... He went on sportscardinvestor.com uh, yeah. YouTube video once or right. twice. Yeah. Right. 
So uh, he, he's not even in the company anymore. He he basically retired. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm talking about there's a CEO guy, so he can't, he okay. goes on some uh, guy's podcast. I can't remember the name of it, but um, yeah, like I mean, they're just not getting out there, uh, and you know the inability, no. as I said, to to use social media to their advantage, which is, you know, your number one tool in the 21st century is social media, right? Um, so it's just been lack thereof, and uh, and we genuinely think that. You know, HGA is innovating. They're using software, um, you know, and I've always, I just bring this line up, yeah. In a uh, 21st century where you've got rocket ships landing themselves, uh, we're still grading by uh, eye and human. Uh, I, what the hell are we doing, right? I, I think, you know, not everything needs to go to software or AI or whatever you want to call it, but, you know, we should be innovating in this space and, you know, what... Um, industry in the world hasn't been helped by technology tell me one right there isn't so why is this space any different and why is psa stuck in the in the past why is bgs stuck in the past you know grading by hand um you know they should they're making that much money they should be able to you know if, if a company can pop up out of the blue and create a software that grades why aren't they doing it right yeah. um so look I, I, well, at, the, at this time like for now PSA can't afford to do that, right? Because they're in the number, they're in the driving driving seat. So they, right. they, they do have some time to buy. But BGS, like you said, they they are in danger of running out of business at some point. Um, because I mean, they're just sitting on their hands. That's they that's really what are. they're doing. Yeah, I think that it's going to like correct itself. It, it's not going to work that way. It's definitely yeah, you, not going to work that way. Like John, you just mentioned like so many good things that HA is doing, like. You weren't even convincing me. You were just believing in the company. Like just by listening to you, like I can tell HGA is doing good things. They're listening to the customers. And these are like simple things, right? These aren't like fancy business models that they, you know, it's just simple things. And, and we said this like two weeks ago, and I, we went on a bit of a rant and we said that what business, like super successful business in their time. Yeah, I'm talking about like Amazon and even eBay to an extent. It took them a while, but they've come around to it. But Amazon, especially uh, Apple, uh, Microsoft, all these big giant companies in the world, like that's why when you see surveys being sent out, like these companies are doing R and D research and develop it, development, and no one knows what that is um, with consumers because they want to know how the consumers feel, and then based on the population of how many surveys are, are done, the percentage of them are completed and different answers, they go, okay, maybe we need to go down this direction. And they use that information to help the, for the betterment of their company. That's how, that's literally how business, it's actually so simple that everyone overcomplicates everything. Obviously, yeah. all the laws and policies and stuff, there's complicated stuff to business, but just the general business 101, yeah, on got how to get people down. in and out of your door is not yeah. that hard. Your it's customers is the foundation. Yeah. Thank you. There you yeah. go. I, I, I work in customer support uh, division on my on my line of work. So yeah. I, I know how important it is to listen to customers, how to how important it is for you to be an advocate for your customers too. Like support what they're saying, you know, listen to them and work on it. It seems like H D H E A is already, you know, ha they already have a head start on that. So it's just like BGS is not doing it. And I think it's the leadership too. Like PSA, the new the 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 new owner is a true collector, right? Yeah. Same thing with HGA. Like he was frustrated uh, by the grading process of sports cars. That's that's how he got into this business too. Where if you look at BGS uh, CEO on LinkedIn, if you look at his background, he, it has nothing to do with sports cars. I was astounded by that. Like he has. Like he's not even a collector. Like, what is he? <laughs> I don't. I don't even know how he got how he landed that job. So it's one of those things. It's like first impressions leave a lasting impression uh, most of the time as well. So I, I haven't checked him out on LinkedIn, but I tell you what, like a picture does tell a thousand words sometimes, and especially when you're in a a business and a company that is is struggling. But yeah, I know this. Yeah. We're saying it's struggling because we're looking from the outside in. From the inside out, they're probably like, oh, you know, we're actually doing really, really well. But from the outside in, we're looking at it going, they've got to make some changes. It's complacency. So, complacency, yep. 
Definitely. Now, the last few things before we do wrap it up, we always like to ask our guests these questions. Uh, is there any cards you think are underrated at the moment? Underrated at the moment. Sets, cards, Sets, whatever. Cards you, could it could be, could be something in left left field. I mean, we know we know you're thinking yeah, Yu Gi Oh. You 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 think that's underrated, but um, are you, yeah. Is there is Yu Gi Oh is one. Is there anything you've, you've been looking at? Like, what's what's what have you been uh, typing into eBay? What do you what have you been looking for? Uh, on my search right now, I've been waiting for I think six to eight months now to pick up a optic hollow of LeBron James from 2018-19. Okay. Uh, I I just like the look of that card. It's hovering around twelve thirteen hundred dollars for PSA ten, but there's not that many of them out there, so um, you. You Very guys, bad on centering you, that card. Centering is horrible. Uh, so PS10, PSA 10 is hard to come by. So that's on my list right now, my search saved list. <laughs> um, I think, like I said, I think Charizard is is on a correction where it might be a good time to buy again. Um, specifically Japanese one, uh, the, the OG rookie Charizard uh, from 1996. Uh, I, I love that card. I have a PSA 4. I just picked it up because I just wanted one copy in any condition. But I, I do want to pick uh, you know, PSA 10 or PSA 9 at some point, um, save up some fund and pick it up. Because it's uh, if you compare it to the English version, it's like it's uh, it's really, really affordable, relatively. Definitely. I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, yeah. Last question. Uh, I know it's an underrated card and you said you wanted to get the LeBron, but what are you looking to collect next? Uh, Ronaldo's. I, <laughs> I, didn't, know, bring, this, I yeah. didn't bring it up, but that was one thing I did want to mention to you. And I was going <laughs> to... He is my I, favorite player. You know, I've got oh, a man really? crush on the man. Okay. Yeah, like... <laughs> I, I just, for some reason, I like him over Messi. I don't know why. Uh, I... <laughs> I'm just more attracted to. I'll tell you what, Tom. I you, you, I think you're. I think you've got a bit of a man crush on Jay now after you said that. Yeah. That's what it is. Maybe I don't know. I don't I know. It's just, the guy is just. He just attracts me. I. I don't know. Like um. Like Tiger Woods. I. I have Tiger Woods, Kobe, LeBron. And goats. I wanted a super card and goats. Yeah, and Ronaldo. I mean, there's a Euro coming up. There's a World Cup coming up. His. His last World Cup, probably it has to be. Not now the other be. thing as well, I'm not sure if you, how into soccer you are, but uh, Sauce and I are pretty much into it pretty big. But the good thing about Ronaldo in his last year and his last World Cup, uh, it's his best opportunity. I know he's already won a Euro, but mm -hmm. it's his best opportunity probably to win both of them. Uh, it's mm -hmm. the best team he's ever had surrounding him. Uh, he's got a lot of opportunity here. So we'll wait and see what happens with it. But honestly, uh, if he does win, let's be honest, if you, he has to win the World Cup. If he wins the World Cup, it's all over uh, when it comes to Ronaldo and Ronaldo cards. So if you're getting in now, regardless, his cards are yeah. going to keep skyrocketing, yeah? Because this Even guy... Even if it doesn't, he, yeah, yeah, I think it'll skyrocket anyway. But uh, so. if he does win a World Cup, though, just... If you if you haven't got a Ronaldo and he wins a World Cup, you won't be able to afford Ronaldo. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Say bye to your opportunity. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Mega Cracks card will be worth a million dollars. Yeah, I you know you know what I think is underrated specifically for Ronaldo is the sticker still. The sticker oh, cards. Yes, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, look, and there's one thing to note on that. Just if you are buying graded ones, don't think like you're safe. There has been so many fraudulent and trimmed stickers out there that have passed through BGS and and even a few at PSA. So just just be mindful. Do your research, please, because um there's uh, a guy who's very good at picking up on this sort of stuff on on IG. That's uh, Jamie UK Collector, um and you know his band of people. He's all into soccer collecting, and it's just you know be careful. Um, I'm not saying that the the sticker isn't a play like it is, um, but just be mindful. There are really dodgy people out there that are trimming these, so. Just be careful. Was was sticker collecting popular in Australia? Uh, not really. Well, kind of, but not really because we've always had cards. Okay. For as long okay. as I've known, because uh, as a kid I, in 99, I was buying the base set Pokemon cards. So mm -hmm. 
it's always been more of a card market for us. Got NBA it. was relatively new around 10, 10 years ago, I'll say, 10 to 10 mm-hmm. to 15, obviously coming in with Upper Deck and stuff, and then it slowly progressed, and then Panini got the rights, and then it took off. But that's because of the ever-growing popularity of the NBA here mm-hmm. in Australia, and that's because, obviously, you get League Pass, and then it's on our, um, right. our cable television company over here. So, obviously, it broadened. People could watch it. Back then, it was hard to go watch games like when i was a kid in the 90s they might show one game a month Mm. like that was it but that was because it was more exposure social media helped it but stickers not really i remember having them as a kid i like i had harry potter stickers and pokemon stickers Mm. Um, yeah i I was asking because you know like i said i'm from korea yeah Um, in, in asia it's popular it has been popular for kids, um, and I th- and I heard it's pop. It was always been popular in Europe too. Europe, it's I reckon Europe is the epicenter and the hub for it. Because, like okay. you were saying, well, you kind of said like in Korea it was pretty rare. It just happened to be in your town that there happened to be a hobby store. But it, what was the card situation like over in Asia? Like, was it as popular as stickers, or was it just a healthy balance? Maybe stickers was was really popular for. Um baseball okay where baseball in... for, for the korean league baseball yeah where and for soccer you, too for europe because obviously europe is so heavily dominated by soccer yeah. soccer yep it was mainly sticker like the products were stickers uh so they had cards but it wasn't as popular as what stickers were and then well, I think so if, now if that the European market catches up, I mean, I'm, that's why I'm thinking like the stickers are really underrated because at some point it should be catching up in the greater think... market for the stickers. Yeah, and you'll start seeing that by the end of this year because Panini's allocating a lot more product to Europe because obviously and tops as well because they've got soccer licenses. So now people over in the UK and like listening to some of them talk and and stuff on Clubhouse that are really into collecting, they're just out there buying as many cards as possible so they're really just loading up on stock and the other thing is like f1's uh tops chrome f1 as well uh Mm. formula one's very popular globally but it's a niche market that's extremely popular in um in europe and i think they had stickers for those as well but now it's obviously moving into cards a good person to collect uh to follow sorry is based here um is a good friend of ours is azuro cards uh, Azuro is in like Italy, like the Azuro. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's A W Z U R O cards. He collects a lot of stickers, and he's okay. opened a lot of sticker boxes before. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's got a couple of those Ronaldo stickers that you mentioned. Um, so yeah, he's really into the soccer space, cards and stickers. And I'll, I'll say specifically on the Ronaldo sticker, it's the uh, the one that I'm getting right now is 2004. Panini UEFA. It's it's okay. his it's his Euro debut, and I believe that's his second ever sticker that came yeah, out. Sick. I think it's the better looking sticker. Everyone says that the black border. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I, I think 2002 one. is like it's just too rare. I and I think it's like way out of a. It's out of my budget. Yeah, so, well, the stickers are crazy, and then it goes down the line as well with like Mbappe as well sticker and whatnot. There's so many different players or all the legends and stuff you can get them in a sticker format so Mm -hmm. not a bad not a bad um well thing to collect i guess so Mm -hmm. but yeah that it's awesome so that sticker will be a nice addition to your collection mate if you can get onto that would be very i I have four at psa coming back soon there you go there you go very nice i like it well thank you jay for joining us we really do appreciate it uh giving up your time uh we're excited to interview you and obviously you gave us some this great was fun time. this was fun thank you guys for we, inviting we me. can do this as often as you like so whenever <laughs> we can do this again we definitely um for sure it was fantastic to do uh you can find jay at studio underscore collector on ig is there anywhere else we can find you jay you want to give yourself- uh same name in my youtube channel yep uh i i'm not very active yet but maybe one day I'll be a lot more active. <laughs> Beautiful. Easy. Lovely. So there you go. 
Follow him on IG and on YouTube. And on behalf of us, thank you for tuning in. Uh, it's been Dom with the great man source and studio under collector, underscore collector. Jay, keep living, loving, and breathing sports. It's double coverage and peace. Peace out, ladies and gents. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you for tuning in. Please don't forget to leave a review on the Apple Podcasting app. Also, follow us on socials, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. Talking all spots, double coverage.